Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to begin our topic on the production of materials by looking at the production of ethylene. So as ever let's begin with an overview. So in this video we're going to go through thinking about crude oil. So thinking about the natural material that we, we use for as the basis of many of the materials that we use. We're going to think about how we can um, we extract useful components out of crude oil by the process of fractional distillation. And then looking at um, the need for a process that we call cracking of uh, the different fractions from frac um, that we get from crude oil. And then looking at what we mean by the process of cracking and the two types, which are thermal and catalytic cracking. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so crude oil. You can see that the, the image that we've got here showing you, um, you know, crude oil in its natural kind of state out of the ground is a complex natural, natural mixture of hydrocarbons. Okay, so it's a fossil fuel formed from the remains of, of plants, you know, many millions of years ago um, that then have been converted into this, this really complex kind of viscous um, mixture. And so then the challenge that we have is that then to be able to actually turn that into something um, useful. So there's a lot of use, very useful components from it, but we need to be able to actually um, process that natural mixture. So we use this process called fractional distillation. So what we do is that we take um, the crude oil and that we heat it up and then we pass it into this fractionating column. But the idea is that it's got this heat source that then the, the, the mixture, the components of the mixture are heated up and then they travel their way up the column, um, moving their way up there, and that as they reach a particular level, that they will cool down. And so based on their boiling point, that they will condense at different stages up this column. So things that are very um, have a very high boiling point will condense very early. And so they, they condense into kind of these reservoirs here and that then are siphoned out at different stages. Ones that have a slightly lower boiling point will condense um, at the next level up and so on and so on. And eventually you get to the point at which even at room temperature, they are still gases. And so then they are traveled out here um, into bottled gas. And so you can see that, and, and, and also right down at the bottom here that we have the thick kind of residue that doesn't um, become a gas at all. And so that then it, it travels out here. Um, and that each of these fractions, each of these different sections of the crude oil mixture are used for particular things. Okay, so you can see some of them listed here. We're going to go through them in a bit more detail. Okay, so we have, depending on their boiling range or kind of where their boiling point kind of falls, um, that different the, the different fractions have, have different names and uses. Now, the reason that we're talking about boiling ranges is that we still have a, 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 a significant number of different compounds that would fall within um, each kind of fraction. They're not a pure mixture. Oh, sorry, a pure kind of substance. They're still, but it's a, it's a much more refined mixture or kind of a a a, ra a, a set of very similar compounds um, that have very similar properties. So things that have a boiling range of less than thirty degrees Celsius are with, are really small hydrocarbon compounds that we use for natural gas or bottled gas. So things like methane and propane that we use as kind of gas fuels, butane as well. In our, in our next one that we have our gasoline um, or petrol kind of fraction so that we use for car fuel. So that's that's where, you know, we get octane and things like that. Um, a range of compounds that are very small, volatile and combustible. Okay, so this is probably the highest demand um, sort of fraction, you know, based on how many cars and vehicles that we have. The next one up that we have a, a, a gasoline fraction called naphtha, um, which is what we use um, and we'll talk about in the next section that we use to produce an additional petrol. Then we get to our next fraction is where we have kerosene. So we think about kerosene lamps, but also um, it's also used as jet fuel. Um, so, so, you know, jumbo jets are powered by this kerosene fraction. It's also used in the process of cracking to produce more petrol. And we get to diesel, which is um, a higher boiling um, point substance again, so used in diesel engines. So you can see that diesel and petrol are very different hydrocarbon compounds. And so diesel and petrol engines uh, work very differently, which is one reason you can't put one in the other. And then at boiling points of beyond 350, that then we get things like paraffin waxes, um, so things that you might have for like Vaseline or, the, or paraffin oil. Um, for lubrication and things. And then the residue, which is even higher boiling point than that, is what makes up asphalt that we would use for bitumen. 
um, in, like when we're putting together roads, okay, the sticky black stuff. Okay, so depending on the size and the boiling um, range of each of these fractions, they have very different uses, but they're all, um, they're all useful in their own way. But the important thing is for us to be able to separate them from each other and then purify them. But the reality is that petrol is the most, um, the petrol fraction is in the most, the highest demand, but we basically, we don't get enough. Um, the fractional distillation alone does not give enough um, gasoline or that this petrol fraction um, for what we need. So we need to be creative about where we can get more from, okay? Because we can't automatically just reduce the number of cars on the road. That's not a simple process. But if we can find creative ways to get more fuel, then that helps. And so what we do is that we, we take some of those heavier fractions that are less in demand and we can break them down into the smaller ones. So because they're less in demand, that we're using up something um, that isn't being already used for something else. And then it also means that we are wasting less. Okay, we're, we're, we're finding a different use for something that may otherwise go to waste. And so we use a process called cracking, okay, which does two kind of main things. Um, and we're going to talk about the specifics of it. The first one is that we get to produce more fuel. Um, so we can actually get more of that petrol fraction that we're after, but also we end up pr producing ethylene and propane, small alkene molecules, which are the basis of polymers or our plastics, which is where we're really focusing today and, and kind of in the next few videos. So what is cracking? Okay, so cracking is this idea of taking large hydrocarbon molecules and breaking them into um, smaller ones. Okay, taking or cracking them. Okay, like taking a long Lego molecule and you're kind of breaking sections off the end. Okay, so if we're taking a, a compound like decane, which has 10, 10 carbons, and then you can see that we're actually breaking at this point to form propane, whether we get a double bond forming here, and then the re remainder is the alkane heptane, so which is um, smaller molecular weight, lower boiling point, more useful as a fuel, whereas decane is just a bit too large. So we get a fuel and we also get the basis of um, polypropylene, one of the kinds of plastics that we're interested in. Now there's two main processes that we would use in cracking. We talk about thermal and catalytic cracking. So thermal cracking, with the, the diagram that you see on the right there, is, as the name would suggest, is that we've got high temperatures. Okay, so 750 to 900 degrees Celsius, and also higher pressures than atmospheric. So we take our, our long chain hydrocarbons, which are longer than we need, and they are pumped in here, and they make their way down to these, what we call our pyrolysis coils. You might remember that pyrolysis is heating in the absence of air, um, which makes sense when we think about heating very flammable and explosive um, compounds, if we, we need to exclude the oxygen. So as we split them up, uh, sorry, as we heat them to very high temperatures, that then what happens is that they split into um, fragments that are free radicals. Remember that a free radical has an unpaired electron. What that ha happens then is that's quite unstable and so it has the tendency to decompose into or to break down into a smaller fragment and also producing alkenes. And so then the smaller fragments that we do at the end of the process, they connect together to stop this, um, this decomposition, this breaking down process, but we end up producing the alkenes that we're after, and, which is one of the things we're, we're after, and the smaller fragments, which are the alkane fuels that we need. So we can see the small hydrocarbon chains um, that are removed at the other end. Okay, so this, that's the process um, of how thermal cracking works. So you can see it kind of illustrated here that we've got the long chain um, decane breaking, and we've got larger, the larger free radical fragments then breaking further into smaller ones. We get smaller alkanes and we get, so, and we get alkenes, um, and then we get the termination where these different um, small radicals combine together. Now we're gonna have another look at these, these, three, um, these three steps when we're talking about forming of, um, formation of addition polymers. So these words will come back again in the future. And then we get to catalytic cracking, the alternative kind of process, because the problem is that high temperatures are expensive for us to maintain. So if we can find a better path or a different path, then that can be a really advantageous. So if we can use a catalyst um, like this one here, this one is called zeolite, which is a crystalline um, aluminosilicate mineral. So it's got aluminium, silicon, and oxygen, and it has a negative charge. But you can see that looking at the lattice, that there's lots of gaps and cavities and crevices and channels inside that, that structure. So that means that we get a high internal surface area, lots of surfaces where those hydrocarbons can stick and hydrogen atoms can be removed. 
So what we have on the right here is a vessel called the cat cracker or the catalytic cracker. That's where this actually contains. It's a very large um, facility. But so because we use a catalyst and we have a lower activation energy, we can use lower temperatures. So around 500 Celsius instead. So that's cheaper and easier and safer. We only use slightly above atmospheric pressure um, because we, we're getting the effect that we're after. Again, we need an absence of air because it's flammable and explosive. Now the process here is slightly different because rather than forming a free radical with unpaired electrons, we actually form a positively charged carbon ion called a carbocation, which I know is a bit strange because it's, it's unlike anything we've looked at before, but the way that the catalyst works facilitates the formation of this positive ion, which then allows, um, which then allows our molecules to break apart in it. So it's a different, different mechanism that removes hydrogen atoms from the structure. Okay, so just to quickly recap, we talked about crude oil as the natural mixture um, from which lots of these useful hydrocarbons come. We know that fractional distillation is the process that we need to separate the fractions from each other, but that fractional distillation alone doesn't give us enough of the fuel components that we need. So if we take longer components and crack them or break them into smaller sections, we get more fuel and we also get the basis of plastics or polymers and that we use two processes of thermal and catalytic cracking to achieve our goal. Thanks so much for watching. Bye for now.